Okay, so um, I, I think uh, Sam had said he's not an expert in camera traps. I, I probably second that. I'm by far a computer vision expert who just really likes working with this type of data. Um, but so don't hold me to um, understanding sort of what happens after I provide species annotation. Um, and also apologize for my, for my voice, I'm a bit sick. Uh, so I'm kind of just going to jump right in um, with why this hasn't been solved yet. Um, so I know a lot of people are familiar with um, iNaturalist uh, and sort of the very wonderful success of computer vision with iNaturalist. Um, I think one of the big differences here is that iNaturalist has a human intelligence in the loop. Um, every time you're taking a photo, uh, you are actually pointing your camera at the thing that you are interested in identifying. So you're basically really helping out the machine learning. Um, but with camera trap images, we have sort of lots of different, and these are only some of the challenges. So some of the poor illumination we talked about earlier, um, animals can be quite blurry. The animal that triggered the detection can be really small. Um, animals can be heavily occluded, um, naturally camouflaged, and also they can be at very strange perspectives to the camera. So all of those images have an animal, um, but these some of them are quite hard even for humans. Um, and then of course, there's lots and lots of empty images. Um, so these are obviously false triggers, but it actually can be really difficult even for a human to determine that there truly isn't something small in the image. Um, I think it's kind of easier to find something obvious than it is to guarantee that there's nothing there. Um, and this actually is kind of, it, it all kind of ties into this fact that when you want to train a machine learning model to do very well on something, it's important to have a lot of diversity in the data that the machine learning model gets to see. It's why when we talk, we talk about big data, we talk about it's really important to have lots and lots of data. Um, but it's really not so important to have millions of images. It's more like for iNaturalist, we find on the order of 50 images for a species is sort of good enough, especially if it's not too challenging with species, to be quite accurate. Um, this is not ideal. Uh, obviously, there are lots of species, even on iNaturalist, where there aren't 50 images of them. And you can imagine that as we go to camera traps, the number of sort of centralized, located images of all of the species that we might care about are quite hard to access. Um, so getting sort of enough images of every species to do well with a machine learning model can be quite challenging. And I'll talk a little bit more about sort of how we can work to de-silo all the camera trap data to sort of assist machine learning people like me in, um, in building models that will be successful for everyone. Um, but so one of the ideas of sort of why it's so important to have like a lot of images for every species is, is that you need to be able to understand pose variability. So one thing you'll see here is it's the same species, but you see it at sort of lots of different perspectives, different angles, different poses. Um, and somehow humans are able to do a very good job um, sort of generalizing to seeing things in ways that I haven't seen them before, but machine learning models, unfortunately, kind of just learn what you teach them. Um, and then this actually causes a problem with camera traps because for a single camera trap, you actually have a lot of bias in the data. You don't get to have that variability that you need to train a machine learning model to do well. So these images are taken a month apart. Obviously, the background is static, um, so you're not getting sort of any differences in background. But also, the animals themselves, because they're habitual, tend to do very similar things. And basically, what this means is that um, it makes it really hard to train a machine learning model on camera trap data that isn't biased towards the camera traps that the model was trained on. Um, and so instead of sort of, oh, we need 50 images, like. In my, my sort of new rule of thumb is, hey, if you're a camera trapper and you have a species you want to do well on, you need to give me an, at least one image of that species at 50 different, from 50 different camera traps. Um, and ideally from different models of camera traps, um, different times of day, et cetera. Um, because really that variability in the data is the thing that's going to make machine learning work. Um, so it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, when I was working at Microsoft AI for Earth with Dan Morris and a lot of the really excellent people there, um, we worked from a paper I'd published the year before that uh, looked at basically extrapolating where these failures were in camera trap machine learning um, when we actually tried to make them work in new camera locations, um, because that's what I want. I want machine learning models that work generally anywhere in the world. I don't 
want to have to retrain a model for every new project or every new set of species. Um, and what we found in that paper, which um, I can link to uh, if you guys are interested, is basically that detection, like just finding an animal in camera trap images was actually not something that had a huge generalization gap. So we were able to actually sort of generalize to new camera locations in finding animals and even finding animals that are species that weren't seen before or in types of the world that weren't seen before. So what you're seeing here is a video of detection results all on completely held out um, cameras from a project that projects that were not seen during training, which is good. I think that's it's actually very important when we're training these machine learning models to sort of train them and evaluate them in a realistic scenario. And I think that for anyone who's out there doing camera trap data, um, computer vision, I think it's very, very important to hold out entire camera locations from your project and evaluate on those camera locations. Unless your test case is that you plan to put out these exact cameras and you plan to sort of retrain every year or something. Um, and actually, if you guys are interested in using the mega detector on your images, um, the people at Microsoft um, and in the Microsoft AI for Earth team have done an amazing job over the last year building like a very simple, easy to use batch API. And so if you go to that link um, on GitHub Microsoft camera traps, um, they, there's, uh, there's all the data is open source, the models are open sourced, um, and it's quite simple to actually uh, run them not only just over a few images, but actually in parallel over millions of images. Um, and sort of cool version of this, let me see if this will work. Um, so I'm actually, I'm currently working at Google and they have this new tool called Overlay. And so we pulled the mega detector in um, as a, because it's a public model and added it to Overlay. And so this is actually sort of in real time running the detector on the images and you can just, you can go to this link and you can just drag and drop some images from your project and just try them out and it'll basically run the detector over your images and you can see how well it works really easily with basically no overhead. Um, and then if you think, hey, okay, that's actually working well enough for my purposes, then you can go talk to Dan Morris at Microsoft and um, have him help you out just running that in batch over lots and lots and lots of data. Um, yeah, and then sort of uh, a nice use case is um, we worked with the Idaho, Idaho Department of Fish and Game and a few others now, um, but we ran the detector over almost 5 million of their images and it took like not that long, as opposed to, I can imagine most of you know how painful it would be to sort empties from non-empties um, over 5 million images. Uh, now, obviously, we're all here for species identification. Um, that would really be great. Um, but that is a lot more complicated. Uh, so not only do you have the issue where you sort of, you as a camera trapper really only care about doing well on the species that show up in your projects. So actually having one sort of classification model to rule them all is maybe not the right paradigm here um, because inevitably you don't want to be trying to classify species that show up in Australia if you actually are working in the US. Um, but one thing that you can do is if you have images that are labeled from previous projects from the region you care about, you can use something that's like very buzzy in the machine learning world right now, which is pretty straightforward. It's just, they call it distillation. But basically, you can take your image labeled data, you can run the mega detector over it to get boxes for all of the images, and then you can just pair those boxes to the class labels you have at the image level. Obviously, you're going to have to pull out any images that have multiple species in them, but it's okay. It'll learn to detect those species separately and that'll be fine. And then you can turn this now class plus box labeled data, which will be slightly noisy because you know no machine learning model is perfect, but noise is okay during training. And you can train sort of a project specific detector or, or bounding box classifier, sort of whichever dimension you want to take. Um, and as far as it goes, like, if you want machine learning to work as good as it can on the common images in your area, the common species in your area, this would take, with the tools that are available now, probably like one smart undergrad, maybe a week or two. So um, depending, I, I think something like this is definitely the way forward as opposed to going in and labeling all the data with boxes yourself, sort of leverage the tools that already exist that are working relatively generally um, and try to use that to 
train more accurate systems that will work on your actual, um, in your actual camera locations. Um, I'm going to talk really briefly about some of the research I've been doing in the last year. So one thing is we talked about how you have rare, rare classes and we don't have enough variability of the data for those classes and then machine learning doesn't work. Um, and so while I was at Microsoft, we built sort of like a synthetic camera trap with the idea being that you could use a game engine and make images that were quite visually realistic um, of a set of species. And then since sort of graphics is developing so much um, and we're seeing a lot of work where you can kind of automatically go from images to a 3D graphical model, the hope would be that then you could take that graphical model, move it around in a, in a basically synthetic world and generate the variability you need to do better on those rare species. And we did see that this worked. We saw that, um, yeah, that you could definitely improve um, your performance on rare species by adding in synthetic data. But actually I think sort of the low hanging fruit here and sort of surprised me was the thing that popped out of this, which is one of the sort of tests that I did was, well, what happens if you just manually cut out the animal and paste it on a bunch of empty backgrounds, just at random with like no intelligence to it. Um, and we actually saw a pretty big boost in performance from that as well. So if you are someone who deeply cares about a single endangered species, um, one way, and you, you're finding that your machine learning models are not working well with that species, one way that you can sort of just give yourself a little boost is um, sort of creating new, new images, um, which are just pasting your animal all cropped out in Photoshop onto empty backgrounds. So you can do it with Python or whatever. Um, and then my most recent work is basically how do we, how do we leverage the temporal information doing machine learning? Um, one of the reasons that I think people haven't done a super great job of this with camera traps in the past is because a lot of the existing methods for aggregating temporal information um, kind of rely on a high frame rate. They're based on videos. Um, and so they assume that the area of interest is going to be the same. And also kind of by definition, they assume a uniform sampling rate. So they don't have anything sort of in there that can handle something like a motion trigger where you're going to get three images and then none for an hour and then some more images. Um, and so I wanted to uh, use sort of more of an attention-based approach. So basically um, use spatiotemporal encodings of the boxes and then actually sort of take those features across much longer time horizons. Um, and for every image, let it sort of decide how to aggregate the information from the frames around it. Um, and what we've seen is that this gives a pretty big bump in performance sort of across all the classes, um, both on Snapshot Serengeti, which is, um, someone asked about computer vision um, camera trap data sets, and there are quite a few on Lila.science. Um, I'll talk about benchmarks in a moment, but Snapshot Serengeti is one of the big ones. And then uh, also on our data set I published called Caltech Camera Traps, which is from the American Southwest. And we saw performance sort of across the board on, um, on both of those data sets and actually on a traffic camera data set. So it's a sort of a more of a generic approach than what just works for camera traps. Um, but so I'm going to be hopefully publishing this in like a week or two weeks um, at a big computer vision conference. And then it's work that I'm doing at Google. So we're hoping to actually incorporate this model into Wildlife Insights. Um, yeah, so just briefly, benchmarks and metrics are really important. I've seen a lot of computer vision papers out there on camera trap data. They all tend to report results on sort of their own data that maybe isn't published or well curated. So it's very difficult to compare to other work in the area. Um, and then also, you know, they're not comparing other methods to their own. Um, and so I think there's a big need for some, some sort of centralized data set that machine learning practitioners can all test on um, or train and then test on uh, in order to make sure that our methods are actually sort of comparable or improving or figure out where they're improving, where they're not. And so I worked with Dan and CEO at Microsoft and we kind of decided that it'd be cool to sort of take some of the data sets that were already well established, um, but we wanted it to be kind of lightweight. We didn't want something that was 10 million images because it's just unrealistic for most people to download, host, and then train on that much data. So we picked just the first season of Snapshot Serengeti, and then um, Caltech Camera Traps, the, the sort of a smaller subset of it um, that all has uh, bounding boxes that were labeled by humans. Um, we've kind of combined those into, we hope that that's kind of, it's obviously not covering the space of everything that you'd see in a camera trap, but it is covering both the African savanna where you can see herds of animals very, very far away and 
um, the American Southwest where things tend to be a little closer to the camera and, and there's sort of different sub species subsets. Um, and so we're recommending that this people use this as a benchmark um, and we're going to put a paper up on archive quite soon, but both of these um, are already available on lala.science along with the um, prescribed loca camera location based um, training and test splits. Um, yeah, and then the last thing is just de-siloing data. So I think, I think I've written, I don't know, probably 30 different data parsers for every small camera trap project's different way of managing and storing their data. And it's, um, it's really diminishing returns. And I think if uh, people who work with camera traps all kind of agree on one uh, centralized data format and also sort of put the data all in a place that's quite accessible, then basically we'll see the machine learning um, only get better and better. Um, so I've been working with the team at Wildlife Insights um, because that's basically their mission as well. They, they wanna provide a central place where people can bring in their data and sort of have it all be standardized in one format, easily explorable and accessible. Um, and so as a machine learning person, that's kind of a dream, you know, it's an opportunity to um, basically build systems that can only get better as the more data comes in, as opposed to building something that works for one small project and then sort of not having a clear picture of how to even move that to help with a different project. Um, yeah, so um, this work was done with a bunch of people. Uh, uh, Lila Dot Science is um, a great place if you guys are interested in also training um, some, if you're interested in training machine learning models or if you're um, interested in sort of pre-training your machine learning models or finding data from species you're interested in. Um, it's a great place that you can pull data. It's all curated sort of well for machine learning. A lot of it's stored in Sort of a COCO style format, which COCO is a very common um, machine learning data set. Um, and then if you guys are interested in re-identification, there's um, at WACV 2020, it's the Winter Conference in Applied Computer Vision. Um, it's going to be next March. Uh, but there's going to be a workshop on uh, deep learning methods and applications for animal re-identification. And um, one of the submission tracks is on basically new, new proposals. Um, so if you guys have a species that you'd like to be able to re-identify in camera traps and you have some theory about what could be used to re-identify that species, like what is the salient thing, like the, the horns of the deer or, or the spots. Um, if you curate some data, you could submit that there and sort of bring it to the audience of computer vision people. And I think that is probably a pretty good way to, um, yeah, to just connect the communities and also get access to grad students who, <laughs> have nothing better to do than solve your problems. Um, okay, I think that's it from me. I'm, I'm sure Thank that there is uh, a lot. No, oh, there we go, stop share, cool. So there was, um, yeah, that was awesome. Thank you. Um, there was, on that last point, um, we had a question come through while you were speaking from Thai Lim, who was asking, can we train the algorithm to detect individuals, which is what you mean when you're saying re-identification, right? It's tracking the same. Yeah, yeah so there are existing methods. Um, so I think uh, if you've heard of Wildbook, um, they've done a lot of really excellent work in this space. Um, there are existing method methods that work for different types of um, re-identification characteristics. So things like spots, stripes, um, the contours of whale fins uh, or elephant ears, those things can be used to re-identify um, individuals. And so if you are someone who thinks, oh, I actually think I have an idea of how we could re-identify this new type of turtle or something, like, please feel free to suggest that. But yeah, unfortunately, that it is somewhat limited um, to animals that have like strong bio biometrics. Is it, it is, it, there's no difference between like stripes are better than spots or like horn, it, it just needs to be differential? I think it needs to just be differential. Um, and I think both stripes and spots are sort of well studied in this space. Um, and then as long as the image is good enough quality, which is kind of challenging with camera traps, um, then that can be done. And of course, there's also the problem of good enough quality and maybe you've only seen the animal from the right and now you get a picture from the left and it's impossible to match them. But, um, yeah. We should follow up, I'll follow up with you after this about putting that call out on Wild Lab so we can get some good use cases. Yeah, for sure, happy to.
Um, there was also another question from Adam who was asking, would using computer generated animals pasting pictures onto the new backgrounds that you talked about account for enough individual variation or is the recognition flexible enough? Anyway. Um, so I think the idea with that work was um, exploring sort of how much um, variation we could add and uh, we did see a big jump in performance. I mean, if you if you have a, a species where you have less than 10 images, you're gonna do pretty badly. And um, you know, uh, we saw probably like a seven, I think it was like a 70% um, increase. Uh, so 70, so 70% 70 improvement. So I think it went up to like maybe 40% mean average precision on detections, which is a kind of a complicated metric. Um, if you guys are interested in disambiguating machine learning metrics, um, feel free to reach out to me offline. Um, but essentially we found that it accounted for some variation, but I don't think, uh, we found that a synthetic image was a lot less valuable than a real image. So essentially you needed something like a thousand synthetic images to kind of contribute as much improvement as a single new real image of the animal. Right. So it's not nearly as efficient. Okay, at this point, I'm gonna bring Roland and Sam back in. Do you guys wanna put your mics and your cameras back on so we can have it as a group discussion? Cause we're starting to get into the bigger questions that like all three of you talked about, touched on in your talks. Um, Simon, um, Simon's got a question around variation between cameras, the sensors and the lenses in different models. Is it an issue? Um, I mean, Sam, God, the, the slide you put up comparing the leopard detection was awesome. I thought Reconics was supposed to be the best at like the the, the be all and the end all for camera trapping. Um, well, they're American made, right? So yeah, they're supposed to be good. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, they're very, they get very good at taking pictures and videos. Um, but yeah, nice pictures. I don't think, they are as fast as some but there are i mean i can tell you more about the reconics there are some clever things they're doing they um like for instance you saw that picture of the the sd card trace where it was doing a bit of processing and then writing the images to it with the reconics um yeah. when you put the sd card in first it will then layer up this entire index inside that sd card so when it writes a picture it just goes right 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 straight away um, doesn't have to do all that pre-processing. So, I mean, that's a little speed up, but I guess um, <clears throat> that's cool. I'd say, I'd say from the machine learning side, no. Um, well, I mean, for sure, this is sort of a known problem in, in computer vision in, in general. Um, if you take a bunch of pictures of one type of camera and you turn up a machine learning system and it's working really, really, really well, and then you bring in a new sensor, a new type of camera, those sort of shifts in in the parameters um will will probably break your machine learning and so the way that you handle this is you do a lot of very hacky stuff during training to sort of change all the different types of contrast etc um but still just having some training data from every type of camera would be the best way forward i think rob do you want to jump in and we'll just get one quick thing from, from our perspective because we we work with citizen scientists that are often using their own cameras and um, our main criteria is that it has a trigger time of less than half a second um, because we set them without bait. And so that works, you know, you still get some miscaptures. I think of animals moving really fast, really close in front of the camera. Um, but that's a criteria that we've used that allows, for, I mean, these days, most of the cameras are that fast. Um, some of the older cameras are not. But so that, that's kind of the one simple criteria that we use for accepting a camera. Oh, and the other thing, that I think makes a big difference is the flash, right? If you use a white flash at night, there are some species that are going to get going to get freaked out, and you're only going to get one picture of them. So I mean, going talking a bit about that further, the um, the the flash thing is you can get two different variants of LED IR flashes. Most are um, eight fifty wavelength, but actually, if you go to nine forty wavelength, that is supposedly um, invisible to most things, um, but they're a bit more expensive. So not all cameras use them. You get that little red glow in some cameras. Um, that's something to think about. Um, but also with this um, wake up speed, it's very hard to know 
how long the camera is doing its between this passive infrared detecting and then it turning waking up the camera and triggering um that thing is quite variable and quite hard to actually work out um but something that we've also looked at doing is if you increase your field of view much wider um you know you can still have a very wide detection area but then you can have a wider field of view the only issue there is then you get these pictures which are the focal length is shorter for a wider field of view so things look like they're further away so i mean that's really useful if you're doing small animals close to the camera um or if you're trying to do things on time lapse far away you know looking at a large landscape um so there's some other things to think about maybe yeah, see, the question you posted in the, the chat seems relevant here. Do you want to jump in? Um, sure, yeah. So this is Jesse Oliver, and I work with Eastern Bristle Birds in Brisbane, Australia. And I was just, I'm doing acoustic detection, actually, and I'm a technologist designing interfaces for citizen science, actually. So, but I was interested in exploring camera tracks as well. And when I did that, uh, the issue that I encountered is bristlebirds seem to be very sensitive to the use of camera traps, and I suspect it was from infrared, because I tried a camera trap with infrared and one without, and they stopped nesting when we used the camera traps with infrared, and I kind of wondered, and I don't have the specs of the cameras, I'm sorry, but um, I wondered if other people have experienced that at all, with birds in particular. I mean, I think, um, you know, I'm not sure how much the infrared makes a difference. Um, it sounds like you maybe found that for your particular species. We've actually looked at a bunch of um, images and, and how the animals reacted, if they noticed a camera, if they didn't notice, if they ran away, if they approached the camera. And it happens with and without the flash. We found no effect of rather, these are all Reconyx cameras, I think, maybe some Bushnell. Um, didn't matter if it filmed the flat, fired the flash or not. It wasn't like all of a sudden, if it fired infrared flash, that more animals came over. I mean, I think when you mount a plastic thing on the tree, animals are going to walk by and say, hey, that's something different that wasn't there. Some of them are, some of them aren't. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe sometimes they make a noise or they, they, they have a little light that they can see that makes them either more curious or more freaked out. But I think just the plastic thing on a tree is going to have some effect on some species. Um, and uh, you know what that is for different species is, is hard to tell. Generally, it seems to be relatively. We would find sort of five to ten percent of the animals would would notice it and and you know maybe respond, um, but, but uh, most of them didn't. But it could be different, especially especially you know at a sensitive site like a nest. You want to be extra careful. Um, and just um, adding on to that as well, um, Oliver Worm, who works in the Institute of Zoology and is I think on these papers and that. WF documents, um, they've definitely experienced when trying to tr um, camera trap wild pigs, that the pigs can smell the humans on the cameras and will stay in those areas, but just avoid that little location around the camera. So potentially maybe these birds are smelling humans more regularly well, when the cameras are there. I should have mentioned they're captive birds. So I would not mess with wild bristle birds. There's only 10 left in Queensland. So we were, Wow. trying to see if we could study the captive population first before we tried to deploy anything. And we're glad we didn't. We never ended up doing it because it was too disruptive for some reason. So we do acoustic sensing instead. In Pierre, do you want to jump in? You had a comment about IR? Yeah, um, I'm based in Bermuda um, and isn't quite camera traps, but we're live streaming from the Bermuda Petrel, which is like the second rarest zebra on the planet. Um, and we've been, um, we built custom IR, which was 940 based. It, it, it's absolutely critical for birds, especially ones like these that fly at night, that regular IR, when you, when you look at it, you see a very slight globe, but with the 940, which is, you know, military grade, we, we, we basically have lights in their nests for six months straight, um, while they're nesting and they don't, it doesn't affect them at all. We've been doing this for eight years, so we know that it hasn't negatively impacted the the birds still return as expected. There's no difference at all. Um, but 940 NM is absolutely critical for for some types of birds, for especially nesting. Um, and it's worth the effort and the expense and et cetera to, to go that route. So that's just my, my two cents. 
Josh, uh, do you have a um, do you have a, a mic? Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah. So I had just had a quick question uh, for Sarah, kind of a follow up to Rob's question, um, in terms of uh, what the future direction is um, for using computer vision and machine learning for camera traps. Um, so do you think one shot and zero shot learning? is a promising area and in particular do you think it could be used for identifying rare or new species can someone yeah. think before you answer it do you want to just give an explanation oh, sure. yeah. so um one shot learning is um identifying something you've only seen before once from a single photo example um and zero shot learning is identifying something that you've seen no times um usually uh the one shot or zero shot um computer vision uh, methods will try to take into account some sort of other information like it'll provide attributes um, for the thing like it'll so you use like you scrape Wikipedia for descriptions of all the different animal species and then you train a model that's able to extract out interpretable attributes from um, from different species and then you try to match those attributes into the graph for example there are lots and lots of different ways that people try to approach this problem um, I think it's far from solved um, and sort of unfortunately when it comes to, unless you add a bunch of additional data, um, just sending the images that you have with heavy data augmentation and possibly some of like that splatting type stuff that I talked about um, seems to outperform um, those zero shot uh, methods, except for sort of in specific cases where you've uh, trained a much more complicated model on uh, with much more complicated um, input annotations. That said, I don't think that I don't think that um, the models that we're currently using are nearly as efficient as humans, for example, I mean, we can recognize a new species pretty easily from uh, from just a few images. So I think that for sure the area of machine learning is moving more and more towards this sort of real world long tail distribution where most of the classes don't have um, lots of data and you don't have lots of sort of annotated data available. Um, but I haven't seen anything that's sort of doing magic yet, I guess. <laughs> uh, okay, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, no problem. Sorry, I'm just trying to read uh, Adam's question, which is a, a big one. Huh. Okay. Adam, do you have a mic? You don't, do you? Oh, you don't. Okay. Okay. You know what? We're going to deal with that question uh, afterwards, because I think there's a... Oh, actually, Roland, this is probably one for you. I'm looking at yeah, I, I can I can answer that one. Um, yeah. So the question is about um, occupancy, and um, to you know, should you target specific sites or to use random placement? Um, and I think <clears throat> so. So with occupancy, it depends on your question. I think so. E either of those could work. Um, generally, you want to increase. You want to have a higher detected. Uh, chance of detecting them. So if that means being on trails, then that's fine. Um, and you can, if you have them sometimes on trails and sometimes on, not on trails, you can use that as a detection covariate to help to, to account for your detectability of them. Um, and so, uh, and then also in terms of, you know, random or on a grid or in some kind of stratified way, you know, if, you're, if your question is about a specific covariate, like, um, swamps versus forests, right? Then you'd want to make sure you had a good sample size in swamps and a good sample size in forests. And if you did it randomly, you might not get that. And so that might be a reason to stratify it. Uh, uh, and then within that stratification, do it randomly or as a grid. So I hope that, I hope that helps. It depends a little bit on your question, but you can definitely account for the difference in detectability uh, uh, in your models, and generally you want to maximize that, even if that means running a, you know, a set lure or something like that for occupancy, it's not so bad. I would say, um, Adam, and there were quite a few people asking, um, uh, asking questions about uh, survey design and best practice. I would say check out the camera trapping best practices guide that WWF produced, which Ollie Wern wrote um, with Paul Glover Kapfer, um, but also, draw on our camera trapping group because these are quite specific questions and talking to someone who's got experience might actually, the one-to-one -one interaction would help. So that's part of what Wild Labs was created 
to um, create the space where you can ask those questions and access that sort of advice. So I would really recommend following up and just putting your questions in our camera trapping group. Um, awesome. Um, Rob, do you want to jump in? I think this, this is a future question, which will be a nice way to, to pull together the threads of the discussion. Oh, thanks, Talia. Yeah, hi, um, Sarah. I was just wondering if you could maybe speak to where you see this sort of all heading in the future, near future, sort of medium term future. For example, can you see something like, you know, the onboard algorithms can kind of self classify new objects that, that they haven't seen before and then maybe distribute that learning to nearby cameras, stuff like that, or where's it, where's it going to head? Uh, can I just yeah. jump in there and say, let's, I'd like to put this to all the panelists and say, sure. yep. what do you think everything's going in the next three to five years? Yep. And like speaking from a practical conservationist perspective, like, is it, how usable it is, is it going to be as well? Um, okay. So moving forward, I think, uh, I think just as more data becomes centralized and sort of accessible to mach training machine learning models, um, we're going to see a lot better results on camera trap data, despite the fact that the data is so challenging. Um, so actually what you were talking about, that sort of camera learning on the fly, um, that's kind of what was going on in, in the paper I very briefly mentioned about aggregating temporal information, um, where the idea is sort of from, you, now you put on a new camera, you don't necessarily have additional training for that camera, but what we do see is that um, you, the, that camera will have its own sort of specific class priors based on um, what animals tend to show up more like more frequently or not. And by sort of letting your um, machine learning model pay attention across very long time horizons, you're able to sort of pull in information about probabilities of classes automatically. And then you also sort of learn like what a certain species will look like at that camera, which kind of helps you um, adapt. And I think that uh, that's sort of just the first step in probably a, a pretty interesting line of research and basically how do you adaptively learn to do better um, in a new camera. And uh, what the second thing you talked about is kind of tied to something called federated learning, which is where you're sort of trying to learn central models. Um, you're actually sending gradients um, back from sort of separate, uh, separate uh, end users. Um, and that's very much something that might uh, end up popping up here, where once we have these uh, cameras that are connected, they could be sending back images, but they could also sort of be sending back just the things that they see, um, which is much smaller, and then maybe sending back um, information about which direction like the, the model should be moving. Um, yeah. Sam, do you want to take, take it next? I mean, yeah, I mean, this is... Um... <laughs> it's something we've definitely looked at. Um, you know, why set the whole picture if you can just do the detection and say what was in that picture? Um, <laughs> however, you know, as you've seen all these sample pictures, that's really hard to sort of say, oh, there was like a rhino at the back and an elephant at the front, and there was like a little baby elephant maybe sticking its trunk in, um, when you're just sending a little code. So actually quite often the whole picture is needed. Um, we've definitely looked at in our back end um, where the images assemble, being able to tag those images with the metadata then attaching to that actual image. And then you can pull in using an API detection algorithms that maybe someone else has built for you, your undergrad in two weeks or whatever, um, <laughs> which would be nice. And then, you know, and then you could pretty much sit that on that one camera, which is feeding that data in constantly. Once you've tagged it maybe for a month of images, um, and theoretically then you could take that image recognition and shove it directly on the front end on the camera if it's optimized enough and small enough to run quickly on the process of the camera. And I mean, when we, when I, yeah, I'm saying all this stuff now, which sounds like I'm pulling it out of, yeah, in the air, but we looked at doing all this before we started building the camera. So it's the processing overhead is all there to be able to do this. The back end should be designed to have those APIs pull in and to tag the image and do that. It's just a case of then developing it now on the hardware that we've built. Um, and like, we don't have that 
capabilities. This is why we have this community because we need you guys to to do that and make this all work for you. I mean, I'm kind of providing a tool, I hope, that everyone will then use and be like, oh, I can now do the things I imagined. Um, we'll see what happens. And Roland. Yeah, well, I, I think you guys have brought up some good points that um, I think are also part of the future. So I'll just bring up something a little bit different, um, which is I think what I hope is that the future is more about collaboration and working together and that we've got these data sets all around the world that are important and interesting, but in isolation, analyzed once or analyzed never, never get to see the light of day. They don't help, help, help the computer vision people. They don't help the, help the ecologists. They don't help the conservation biologists. And so I think, um, you know, to me, it's, it's, it's about uh, combining resources to solve these problems together, whether it's um, a place where the AI can sit, um, that whoever builds it. And, and so that's what we're trying to do with Wildlife Insights is have a home where um, you can go as a field biologist and make use of these AI stuff without having a computer science degree. Um, and at the same time, have the data in one place so the ecologists, the conservation biologists can come along and then also a place where we can build some of these new statistic tools that uh, you can run them from there, either getting the data in a standard format with metadata or having some built-in tools. And so this is really kind of the vision that we're trying to, to pull, pull together in Wildlife Insights and it's pretty grand and it's a little behind schedule, but we're still all pushing forward. Um, and uh, I saw a, a comment in there about data security and endangered species, and we definitely have stuff built in to protect the locations of those endangered species so that they're, they're not um, easily available for non-scientists. Um, but, you know, I really think seeing what we've been able to pull together on a, string, a, a, a shoestring budget with Snapshot USA, of how many, I mean, 127 people came out of the woodwork and said, yes, let's run cameras and share data together, and we're doing it right now. Um, is pretty awesome. And I think it shows that there, there is a lot of interest in this. And um, I just think, it, I hope it'll keep growing. Yeah, I mean, the machine learning is only going to get, it's only going to be good when, when everyone shares their data. You can train your own detector on your data and it'll work okay, but it won't work nearly as well as if you shared that data with someone else who is also interested in those species and the two of you combined trained a model on that shared data. So we have decentralized is the only way it's going to work. We see a lot of members in the community sharing data for those purposes, which is really, I think collaboration is the way forward. Um, and on Wildlife Insights, when it's formally ready for launch, we'll we're looking into having a, a webinar dedicated to it so you guys can put all your questions to the team and we can really go into depth of like how it's useful for conservationists, but also from the tech side of things, how people can get involved. Um, so I realize we're over the, over the half hour, so, I just want to say thank you very much to all of our panelists and our speakers. It was fascinating. Um, and we had a, I've, I've learned so much and I mean, everyone's stuck around. So I think we've all found it super interesting. Um, and I will say thank you to Talia and she's just posted a link to uh, the recording and the notes from this session. Um, and if this wasn't enough, there's a two day um, camera trapping workshop that um, is happening in two or three weeks. Um, as so I would recommend um, joining that. There's gonna be virtual options to, to tag in and because it's for two days, you'll go right into the depth of like some of the questions we only just touched on in this session. So I um, want to keep an eye on. Uh, I've just dropped a link to find out more about, oh, Ariel and I are both there, good. Um, but uh, thank you, everyone. Um, it's been fantastic. Thank you, Talia, who runs everything behind the scenes and makes this happen. And the next one will be on eDNA in a few weeks. So keep an eye out for information on that. Guys, thanks, everyone, and we'll see you later. Okay, thanks, Seth. Bye, everyone. Thanks for putting this together. Thanks for inviting me. Our pleasure.